Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 15, titled, The Heart of God, Part 2. Welcome. We're in the book of Luke, chapter 15. Got a Bible with you. Got a phone with you. Something. Find your way into the Scriptures. Luke chapter 15. We have no direction apart from the Word of God. And when the Word of God gives us direction, well, we've got to follow it. What good does it do for us to know the way and not take the way? You're just liable. Uh, let's not be liable. Let's be responsible and do what God tells us to do. Luke chapter 15, Jesus is telling us these beautiful parables, uh, probably some of the best-known parables in the world, uh, not just uh, in the Bible but in general. Um, these stories of these three lost things, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And the point of the parables is the response of the Father. Uh, the main point is not that it, it is not not to say on our subjective end of things, isn't it great to be saved? But the the real issue is the fact that God is the Savior. That's the thing we have to get through, and that's the point that they're, that they're missing here, and the reason why Jesus tells these stories. So Luke chapter 15, we're going to be down in uh, verses 1 through 10, and then uh, down in verse 32, just we're not going to read the, the last parable, at least this time together. So let's read the first two. Now it says, All the task gatherers and sinners... We're coming near him to listen to him. Why? Because he wanted them. He was open arms to these people. He ate with them. He ministered to them. He called a task gatherer, uh, Matthew. Most of us think of a task. Most of us don't like task gatherers anyway. But uh, I don't know if you like to pay taxes. I don't. But uh, task gatherers back then were effectively mafia. They would break your legs. You know, we only now are coming up with our armed IRS agents. They had them back then. They're all, their whatever they were called, IRS agents. They were all armed. They had a group of thugs that ran around with them. If you didn't pay, well, we just break your legs. You know, it's no big deal. Uh, that, that is truly, that's Matthew. So Jesus calls a guy like that to be one of his disciples. So Jesus, boy, did he ever hang out with these quote-unquote sinners. And the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he tells them this parable, because they're so far from the heart of God. They're so very distant. They're so uninvolved with heaven. So he tells them, tells them three stories of heaven. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which he has lost? Of course he would. He said, in our culture, we really don't understand this because 99 out of 100 is a passing grade, isn't it? Still an A. They, this is not a grade system. This is their business. This is their life. This is their property. A sheep was something you'd invested your life in. Of course, in, in their culture, of course you did that. It's an axiom. It's axiomatic. When he had found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Of course he would. And when he comes, comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying then to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Of course he would. That would be a big deal in a agrarian, agrarian culture. They would understand this. So it's just like they're just nodding their heads. Oh, yeah, 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 we understand that. We understand that. And then he hits them with something they wouldn't have understood. It's just as axiomatic. They should have known this. We should know this. Jesus is telling stuff we don't know. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Notice, not just sinners, but those that repent. So it's critical. Repentance is critical. Over one sinner that repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He tells us a story about heaven. You haven't been there yet. He's telling you about what heaven's like. What do they get excited about in heaven? Sinners coming back to God. Saying the way that they chose it was wrong. And the only way through it is is to return to him. And that's what they're doing. Or what woman? See, story number two. Same story, by the way, just different version, different different angle, different facet. If she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Of course. Of course she would. We're going to see why in a bit. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, rejoicing with, say, rejoice with me, I have found the coin which I have lost. Of course they would. In the same way, here's the point. Uh, the thing you didn't know, 
The thing that we all knew was the fact that sheep get found by shepherds and that coins get found by women who lose them. The thing we didn't know is that heaven has a similar reaction to something else that's lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner repents. doesn't say God celebrates anything else in the whole Bible. That he throws a party over getting people like you and me into heaven. Now what, what do you, no offense, and me have to offer heaven? I, I can't figure it out. But I'm telling you, we are valuable to him. Jesus is letting us in on the heart of God and letting the, the people here who are, who are against the heart of God in on the same story. Notice that we're not going to read the parable of the lost son, but, but let's, let's all the way down to verse 32, the last verse of the chapter. Notice the reaction when the son comes home. We're going to understand this as applies to the same reaction is happening in heaven when one comes home. But when we, But we had to be Mary. Of course we would celebrate. Because why? And rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and has lost and has been found. Why? Of course we would celebrate this. Jesus is saying something that you should know, we should know, they should have known, we all should know. Hell, heaven absolutely celebrates when lost people come home. Absolutely throws a party. It's so far into us, what do you think heaven's going to, what do you think of God? What's your image of him? See, many times we have an image that's formed of God, not from the scriptures, but from our culture, from our experiences, from what other people have said. Let the scriptures tell you how to think about who God is, who is God. You're getting a very clear picture of that very thing. So, so again, the, the greater theme that we have here, the, the, the major theme, of course, of the parable is that lost are being found expresses the heart of God and how far the people of that day were from it and how far possibly we are too. But there's a greater theme here. And that greater theme is the celebration. So we always look at salvation from a subjective standpoint. Look at what happened to me. God saved me. God forgave me. God found me. I couldn't find myself. By the way, those are, those are great stories and important. Those are not unbiblical in any way. But we, don't hardly, we only look at it from the saved, I was been saved. And we hardly ever look at it from the Savior standpoint. What is he getting out of this? Great joy. Did you know that? Is that your picture of God? Because I would say to you on the word of Jesus, if it's not, you need to change pictures. It's inaccurate. It's not right. You don't have the whole picture. Remember the point of the Bible is that we know God, not know ourselves, even though that's part of the that's consequence. You may not like what you find out. As you read the scriptures, some reason why people don't read scriptures. They don't like to know. I'd rather live in oblivion and be fooled all the way until the day I die, then, of course, oblivion ceases to be. You get to know everything there. Better to know now and do what's right now. But the point of the Bible is not to know ourselves. It's to know God. God wrote this so that you would know it. He inspired it through the men who wrote it so that you would know who he is, how he deals and how he feels about sinners, which is what you are. It's what I am. How God responds to us. Does he reject us? Does he love us? Does he hate us? What is... What's the answer to these questions? Again, Jesus makes this very clear, knowing God. John 17. And this is eternal life, Jesus speaking, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It is the greatest problem in the world. People don't know him. He created us. He owns it all. It's all coming back to him. We're going to have to answer to him. And yet we don't know him. It is the greatest problem problem on the planet people do not know him heaven and hell are going to be places where it's going to be full knowledge it's not going to be like it is now watch here again writer of hebrews quoting out of ezekiel i'll put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts and they will i will be their god and they will be my people and no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another know the lord so preachers are going to cease to have a purpose in heaven i actually think that's going to be great <laughs> I get tired sometimes because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. It's going to be a universal thing. It's just not universal here. Again, our problem, our focus needs to be know the Lord. Know him. Listen to what the scriptures have to say. The biggest theme of these parables is something that we may not know about God, that God rejoices over people who repent and turn to him. He absolutely rejoices. Is that the picture you have? of God. 
Because if it's not, your picture is inaccurate. It is not correct. Is that the picture? Again, notice Romans here just all over the Scripture saying the same thing. For the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What are we going to be doing up there? That. It's going to be a whole lot, in fact, nothing else but that. Righteousness. Do you know what righteousness is? Wow. You get a glimpse of it, so do I, occasionally in our lives. It's kind of like a, the middle of the road. We hardly ever hit the middle. We're all the, off in a ditch this side or off in a ditch that side. A, a picture of righteousness in our culture of, whoa, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, is it not? Heaven's going to be filled with it. Heaven's also going to be filled with another thing that we don't see much of, peace. And another thing that you might not know is there, joy. The Father being so glad that you're there. Is that your picture of God? When you come there just rejoicing, I'm so glad you're here. I've paid so much for you to be here. That's a fact he has. It's an absolute fact. Uh, Romans 15, verse 13, the prayer of Paul for the church there at Rome. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Can he fill you with something he doesn't have? He's loaded with it. It's who he is. It's, it's, he's filled with joy constantly, constantly. And he's rejoicing over us who turn in repentance towards him. Is that your picture that you have of him? Here's, here's another one. Is this your picture, his response to Israel, repenting and turning to him? Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice in your hearts. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord your God, in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Is that your picture of God? He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What would God's singing sound like? Think about that. Part of heaven's going to be God singing. We always think about us, you know, the angels singing and the saints singing. I'm going to have a great voice when I get to heaven because, I, you know, I don't have one now. But what about God singing? We never hear of that. We never talk about that. We always have this stern idea of God, you know, just can't wait to kick sinners off into hell. Hell's a real place, guys, but it's not a place that God wants for us. He, re- he doesn't rejoice over those that pay, pay for their sins. He rejoices over there who let him pay for their sins so that he can have them. Is that the picture of God? It's not accurate if it's not. It's not. Is it, I couldn't find any pictures of God rejoicing on the internet, so I came up with this guy. <laughs> Is that your picture of God? Because that's a celebration. And that's what God does when a sinner repents. Is this your guy? Is this your guy? I, 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 uh, I think that's a good picture. And, and what about the angels? I couldn't find any angels either, but I could find some stormtroopers. They're dancing. They're getting their clues from God. Look at verse 10. It says there will be rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So they're watching God to see what God does. And, and God's the first guy, right? And then they start. And then the saints, you know, they're the recent comers. They start doing that. Is that your picture of what happens? You see, we don't rejoice a whole lot over sinners. We don't. Coming to God. We don't put a lot of effort into it. They're, they're, they're as they were for the Pharisees and the scribes. They're a problem for us, seems, in the church. We just need good people in here. We don't need the riffraff sinners because they cause problems. They don't know the right answers. They got bad language. They have bad attitudes. And heaven is searching for an opportunity to throw a party over people like that. And we're quite different than heaven, it seems. It, Jesus, notice Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, verse 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for what? The joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy of having you there. He put up with all that. Because that's what it took to get you there. Is that your picture of heaven? Or is it just some old man sitting on a throne who just you know doesn't have anything better to do than to put up with sinners and so he's kind of grumpy about you being there and so he's just making room for you? Or is it this? If it's not this, it's not accurate. Do we really know who God is? Do we really understand him? See, this is the point of the parable. Hearts were so far from God. They had really nothing to do with heaven whatsoever. All about heaven, all about the Bible, right? 
So far, Jesus just exposes them so accurately when he tells these stories. And we've seen some of that. We're going to see more of that today. But remember last time we saw this, that Jesus, the summation of all of Jesus does in all of the Bible is this one sentence. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's all that he does. Everything else bows to this. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is a means to an end. And the end is that sinners would come to the Son and to the Father. He's seeking and saving that which was lost. He's not doing anything else. What has God up to today? That. That's what he's doing. He's not doing anything else. And so we have these three beautiful stories. We saw last time the story of the shepherd and the sheep. And this time we're going to be looking at this woman with the lost coin verses 8 through 10. And so Jesus exposes the fact, like I said, that these Pharisees and scribes are not involved in anything that's happening in heaven. They're doing the opposite. The ones that heaven is looking for, they're doing their best to get away from. The one that heaven loved, they hate them. They don't want anything to do with them. They can't believe that Jesus would have anything to do, much less eat and spend time with them. He exposes them completely. And he does that by first telling two stories Basically asking questions. These first two stories are questions that draw you in. Which man among you, if he has a sheep that's lost, would not go out and find him? What, what woman, if she's lost one of ten coins, would not search the whole house? He pulls them in. He's an incredible storyteller. He's telling these beautiful stories. And, and, of course, we saw last time, if you were with us, they were offended. They would have been easily, probably, probably greatly offended that Jesus would have pulled them into a story where they would have had to think of themselves as shepherds. That's offensive to them. Because shepherding was beneath them. Shepherding was a defiled line of work, primarily because you don't leave sheep, because if you leave them, you won't have them when you get back. And so when the Sabbath comes, guess what? You can't go to church. Oh, well, you know, you're off, you know, the list. Of course, these these, uh, hypocrites, Jesus calls them that, Hire people, they pay people to not come on the Sabbath so that they can look down their long noses at them and say, oh, who would be a shepherd? They're making all their money off the sheep. They're wearing the clothes that the sheep were made from the sheep's wool. They're eating on Sabbath the the sheep that were raised by these guys they're looking their long nose down at. They're snobs. They're hypocrites. They live off of them, but they ask like, oh, we're not involved in that, and we can't believe that you would draw us into a story like that. Well, he's gonna, he takes them to another level by taking them into a story where they have to think like a woman. Who would want to be a woman, right? The women, Well, not even all women. I know some women that would rather be. I, you know, I, 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 you, know you, find, you find this here, you know, this, this whole thinking like a woman. So they feel defiled. There, there's this... I, for lack of a better way to put it, they had this philosophy I call the defilement of thought. But not the, the Pharisees were so separated, so regimented, so so legalistic and ritualistic in everything that they did. They literally would not even allow them, like to be drawn into a story where they had to put themselves in the place of a shepherd would defile them in their minds. Oh, now I've got to go home and immerse myself and change my clothes, and I don't know. Uh, say certain prayers, they would have all these things that they would have to do because it was very ritualistic. So, But now he didn't just make them feel like a shepherd. I mean, the next story, boom, now they're thinking like a woman. They're even more defiled. Shepherds were defiled and women were disrespected, and that's the two things that they lived totally against. We want nothing but respect, nothing but cleanliness. And so Jesus just pulls them right in. No permission asked. He just sucks them right into these stories, and Jesus' questioning stories requires them to put themselves in a place of a woman, and they wanted nothing. They didn't want to be compared to a shepherd, and they certainly didn't want to be compared to a woman. And again, Jesus is just simply exposing their hearts. Because you find in the Bible, God compared himself to both of those. In fact, he has no problem being compared either to a shepherd or a woman. In fact, uh, uh, classically so in Psalm 23. So, so these Pharisees didn't want to even be compared to a shepherd, but God according to David, is a shepherd. See how far they are? All the while claiming to know the Bible, claiming to know God, claiming to have the corner on the whole religious market, and yet they're so far from what the actual Bible says about who God is. Two things it says in the Psalms about God that they would have absolutely bristled over. Number one, it says that he calls himself, considers himself a shepherd. Number two, notice what he does for David. 
You prepare a table before me, in this verse 5, right? In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Two things, two roles that the Pharisees and the scribes would have never found themselves in. Number one was a shepherd. Number two, by the way, everything after that is woman's work in the Middle East. No man ever prepared any food, or set, especially of this level or ever set any table. Very separate roles. Very separate. Man didn't touch a plate or a fork unless he was eating off of it. Didn't mess with food unless it was cooked. Didn't dress the animals. Didn't, you know, he may harvest them. He may kill them, but he didn't do anything. A woman did everything. All woman's work. Notice, God acts like a woman. Has no problems acting. Compares himself 100% to women. And shepherds. He's both of those things. So talk about just throwing these guys underneath the bus so quickly, so effectively. Jesus went even further, by the way, comparing him. He didn't just compare himself to a woman. Watch this. We read this one recently, Luke 13. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you to children together as a rooster gathered. Nope. As a, not just a female, but a female chicken. Gathers her brood under her wings. That is, in, in that culture, very demeaning. You would have never heard a, a comparison like that from them. Jesus doesn't care. I'm not afraid to compare himself to a woman. Nothing wrong with women. Not at all. He created them. He loves them. Women were extremely respect, disrespected in this culture. They didn't even teach them the Bible. Couldn't go to synagogue. What's the use of teaching a woman the Bible? You know, you keep them dumb and you keep them down, right? That was, their, that was the way they operated. That's the, way, that's the way they rolled. A famous pharisaical prayer from this first century was, O Lord God, I thank Thee that I was not born a Gentile or a woman. Every day they prayed that prayer. As bad as life could be, I'm not a Gentile and I'm not a woman. It was just their attitude. Jesus pushes them into a story right into defiling themselves and comparing themselves to shepherd and women. So let's, let's get to the heart of the story, which is these ten coins. What are these things? Of course, ten coins, we understand that. But why is it so important to us? I got more than ten coins at the house, and if one of them fell, I'm finding them all the street all, all the time. Our money is worth less and less and less and less, it seems. Find a penny, pick it up, right? Not anymore. People don't pick those things up. It'll leave them standing, sitting there. So this woman has ten coins. And many have conjectured about what they can be, and they could be several things. Uh, I think the context of the story demands us to look at just one particular area, but they could have been her dowry. They could have been something that was given to her so that when she marries, she's able to bring it into the marriage. My wife and I, we got married. She brought a car into the marriage. I brought a car into the marriage. It was, I had a better car, but I got to drive her car because, you know, that's what marriage is. You put your wife in the worst car, but... It was our dowry. We didn't have absolutely nothing else. Um, some old flowered, ugly couch that she brought, by the way. It was great. We lived through that. And a waterbed. Thank you, honey. That was a great waterbed. But so, so she would have had these ten coins given to her by her father to bring it into the marriage so that she would have something to contribute so that the young couple could get off their feet, you know, without getting into debt. And that was the whole, whole idea. And that's a possibility of these coins, except when you read the context of the story, which is very small, just a couple of verses. It, there's no mention of a father in there. In fact, the feel of it, you may disagree with this, but the feel of it is that she's the woman of the house. But that not, would not be the condition if she's unmarried. So, so I would suggest to you that the impression that I get from it is this is a married woman, probably with kids. So this totally shifts the purpose or the, the, the way and the purpose of these coins. What would happen to a married woman, why she would have coins like this and why they would matter is because her, it's, a, it's a total male-dominated society. Women don't work, not legitimately anyway. So men work, women stay home, they're the women of the house, he's the man of the field, the women take care of the house and the children. Our culture isn't too far removed from some of that, not too many years ago. The women take care of the, the house and the, the, the kids. But what happens if husband has an accident and dies today? She has no way of making money. None. What happens if he falls ill? What happens if he breaks a leg in a farming accident? What happens if there's some other kind of emergency and he has to be removed from the situation? How, do they, how does she make it? 
with, and take care of the house and take care of the kids over a protracted amount of time until some kind of arrangements can be made. That's what those ten coins are for. She, she, typical, typical male, if, if we could say this is typical, and I would think it probably is, typical male would work all day for one of these coins, and he would spend it on the means to live for the family, his wife and his kids, for the next 24 hours. Which means in the next 24 hours, he's got to work again. So we live paycheck to paycheck. They live literally day to day. Whether we ate today or not, depending on whether I got a job today or not. Many of them were these itinerant type of workers, and so they did that. A majority of them were. And so these coins represent a day's labor. So if we're only making a day's labor, how do they save up 10 extra coins? Woo, a lot of scrimping and saving. We, spend a, we only earn a coin a day, and we pretty much spend a coin a day. So shaving off a tiny bit of a coin every day for a protracted amount of time would be the way that they would come up with these 10 coins. And so these 10 coins are, are the emergency fund for extreme circumstances. A uh, uh, husband would often give them to his wife, and they were not spending money. They were emergency money. Something happens to me, sweetie. This is how you take care of the kids for the next 10, 15, 20 days until other arrangements can be made. Family can come in, something can happen, but at least gives them some kind of ex- extension of a little bit of safety and security for her so she would protect these pretty much with her life because it was her life. And she would wrap them in a little cloth and tie them very tightly, and they would always be on her person. They didn't have safes inside their house. So she would keep it in a pocket or keep it tied around her waist. Or, you've seen this before, maybe not understood it, but images out of the Middle East like this, you seen those? Where a woman's wearing a headdress, why has she got coins on there? Of all the things she could put on there, why coins? Well, number one, they're made of precious metal. Well, you want gold, there you go, honey, we got gold. You want silver, we got silver. And so what would happen was, is because this is, you know, if they can't earn, but can't come up with 10 coins extra to take care of themselves, he, she's certainly not getting a, a necklace or a ring for their anniversary. You follow me? They don't have that money. But they do have, I mean, nice looking stuff. And so she would make, what better way to take care of the coins that you don't want to lose than to have them strapped on the front of your head? Make sense? Goes up to one of her girlfriends and say, do you count 10 coins? I count 10 coins. Okay, we're good. Another day, here's another picture. This is modern day Armenia. They still do this. I mean, it's probably just symbolic. Uh, Certainly women can work today in those cultures very differently than they could back then. But they, they would have this, they would keep this in a very, very careful place. What better place to have it than to have it as jewelry? You can constantly see it. You know where it is. And, and so, so what happens here, she loses one of these coins in the house. And the house guys did not have electricity. They did not have windows. They were very dark. You lit them with the lamp. I don't know when the last time the power was out and you lit a candle in your house. How well do you see with that? I mean, the big stuff, you know, don't kick your foot on the furniture or nothing like that, but it's not like a spotlight. So we got a, a house made of effectively mud, a floor definitely made of dried mud, and a coin falls down, and what happens to dried mud? It cracks. It, there's just no telling. When was the last time you dropped a coin and it just fell flat right there? It hits the ground, bounces once, and rolls any place. So she's got dirt, she's got cracks, she's got debris on the floor. Where could the coin be? anywhere they've scrimped and saved they've worked hard they've deprived themselves to save up for these coins and now she's counting her headdress and bingo one of them isn't there it is a desperate situation you understand understand this she's going to find this coin of course she would we, we again all this to place ourselves into this culture of jesus would have been speaking axiomatically like i said they would have known this of course Of course she would look for that coin. That coin is very, very valuable. Lucky to have ten. You certainly don't want to be down to nine when you had ten. She's going to haul every piece of furniture out of that house if she has to. She's going to look in every crack. And by the way, you know, a candle, you know, it just doesn't, you're going to have to get down on your knees. And you're going to have to hold it like a candle or a, or a, or a, or a, a, is it, is that me? Or Or a lamp. You're going to have to hold that thing down near the ground. You don't have a flashlight where you're looking around. Coins don't find themselves either. I mean, yeah, they're silver, they're gold, they're shiny, but what if it gets dirt on it? What if it falls into a crack? 
coins have a face on them, but the face doesn't talk, does it? No, it doesn't find itself. All the finding is on you if you're the one looking for it. All the burden, 100%. Again, this story is axiomatic. Of course she would look for this coin. Of course the shepherd would look for the sheep. And we should assume Jesus is the thing, the thing that we didn't know. Of course God looks for lost people. Don't you know? Do you not know God? Of course he loves them. Of course he stays up and doesn't go to sleep until he finds them. Of course he'll do anything to get them back. And I do mean anything to get them back. Of course he would. Don't you know him? Don't you know him? That's the story Jesus is telling here. And, and, and by the way, verse 10, he not to just bring them in. He celebrates them. He's, he rejoices over them. The, there, will be, there will be joy in the presence of the angels. So the angels are the audience. Who's doing the dancing? You got it. Who's doing the singing? They're taking their cues from him. They learn their dance moves from God himself. Heaven, you're going to learn too. Heaven's going to be a place of rejoicing. God is the chief. He's the head of all of it. He's the one. Why, why does it say stuff like this? Jesus says this, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will blot, not blot, his, blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father. It's like a roll call, and every time they do it, they break out into big old songs and dance, and everybody plays and has a good time, and the chief leader of all this is God's Father, God the Father, God the Son. Because it's a cause of great parties. So, so she would have fretted and worried and gone without sleep until she found this coin. And uh, who knows how long it's been missing. She wore the headdress yesterday. As best as she could recall, I don't know if you wake up in a fog like I did, but I can't remember, you know, I've slept since then is my favorite term. I can't remember what I did or what I said. I've slept since then. As best as she can remember, she slept since then. They were all there. So she's hoping they're in the house. It fell off somewhere here. All she knows is this morning when she gets up, there were ten there's only nine. So, like I said, she's going to turn over every rock. She's going to search every crack. It doesn't matter where it is in this dingy little home, that piece of silver or gold covered in dust, she's going to find it. Like I said, there's no locator. Coins don't find themselves. She finds them. The whole burden is on her. And here's the whole point. The thing that would have irked them, the thing that would have blown them away, is that God himself is that woman. When it comes to sinners, that is who God is. You don't know who God is? Jesus is telling us who he is. He is a God, the God, who searches for the things that have been lost. So it's a descriptive of who God is, a descriptive of who we are. People don't find God. Coins don't find women. <laughs> the women got to find them. People don't find God. God finds them. This is, this is the mission evangelism and missions is a work of God, not a work of people. We get to participate in that, praise God. I mean, it's, it's awesome. But I, the motivator is God himself. Dead in our trespasses and sins, that coin's got a face, can't talk. Same is true with sinners. Now, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know somebody's paying everything to get them back and living for the day that he does. That's who God is. That's who God is. God lowers himself. God lowers himself in the dust of the place that descends all the way down to the cross and through that shines the light of his gospel into our lives so that he can find us. And by the way, he's not without information. It's not like he doesn't know where you are. That's the difference in the story. I told the kids, God doesn't lack information. It's, will the sinner say, okay, okay. He lives for this. Heaven rejoices over this. He's the example of all that. But it remains for the sinner to say, yep, okay. Now, you don't even have to say, here I am. You don't have to say, I, you know, I've been missing. It's to say, God, I, I agree with you that I'm lost. I agree with you that my sins have separated me from you and that there's not a way to come back except your way, which is through his son, Jesus. Not through being religious. Not through being a good person. But, but coming back to him. Otherwise, you're, you're stuck in a crack somewhere. It, Coins don't come out of cracks. They don't dust themselves off. They don't announce themselves for the ones who are li listening or looking for them. No, they're staying there forever. 
unless they're found. God is determined to find them. And, and again, the story, if you know him, you know, of course he does this. Of course he does. How close are we? How far are we from the heart of God? That's what the story is about. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are determined to find us. And many of us can't understand why you would go to the great extent you went to to pull us out of the cracks that we found ourselves in, to knock us out of the dust and the dirt that we had gotten covered up with, the dark corners that our lives had rolled ourselves into, but you are a missionary God, an evangelist God, seeking and saving that which was lost. That's us. I pray that this place would be a place where the lost are found, where we'd be willing to say, okay, God, I, that's, I want that too. God, I, I want to be found. You know where I am. The only thing keeping you from finding me is my willingness to say, okay, God, I turn from all the things that I thought were saving me, the things I've dedicated my life to possibly, and I turn to you as my only hope. And you rejoice over me. Thank you, God, that that is so true, and that you're so willing to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.